Welcome. Thank you so much for spending some time watching this video and learning a little bit more about rabbit resistant plants. My name is Kathleen Carr and I'm the owner of a company called The Growing Scene. We are a garden center and landscape company. This year we celebrate our 25th year in business and helping gardeners. I really appreciate uh, your time and I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you tonight about rabbits and and unfor the unfortunate damage that they do. Rabbits, in addition to deer and voles and squirrels, can cause a tremendous amount of damage in our gardens. You can see here listed on the screen there the six primary um, methods of damage, um, everything from eating to burrowing to rubbing and even digging in our gardens. It can be uh, quite um, disheartening <laughs> to see all of your work um, being damaged by animals. But this video will attempt to give you um, some ideas and kind of tips and tricks to protecting your plants and, and actually the type of plants uh, that you may want to consider planting to um, prevent that damage from occurring. So as cute as these little bunny eyes are, <laughs> the teeth on this uh, bunny can be incredibly damaging. Um, I chose this particular picture because I think most of us have heard that marigolds are supposed to be rabbit resistant, and I think that they are rabbit resistant, but they certainly are not rabbit proof. In fact, no plant is uh, rabbit proof. Um, there's some things that may, you know, kind of be on the bottom of the, say, grocery list for rabbits. Um, marigolds may be among those plants. Um, but if they get hungry enough, they're going to eat a whole, you know, wide variety of different things that, you know, we thought that they typically wouldn't eat. And marigolds are just kind of one example of that. Um, speaking of examples, here are some examples of rabbit damage. Um, the top left slot, uh, picture on this slide shows you the very typical, you know, kind of uh, sharp cuts that rabbits make. They're generally at about a 45 degree angle on, on stems or twigs. Uh, they're really clean cuts, um, very distinguishable as rabbit damage. On the bottom right, um, I don't see this type of damage um, nearly as often as I see kind of the clean, you know, angular cuts. Um, but the damage on the bottom right picture is showing where they're kind of girdling or eating around the trunk. Um, it seems to me that these bunnies were really happy and after they had, uh, you know, kind of eaten the tops of those smaller twigs, the, the ones that they could reach, then they started even eating the, uh, eating around uh, the bark and girdling that tree. You can also see towards the bottom of the snow all of the rabbit pellets that they've, pellets that they've left. Again, it's just another indication that, that um, yes, there was, you know, there were rabbits in there and they were having quite a feast, unfortunately. Um, so just a little bit of background information. Um, you know, it's, it's pretty common knowledge that unfortunately rabbits uh, can produce a lot of young in one a year. They can have three to four litters a year, uh, leaving, you know, always kind of a new crop of bunnies that are coming into our yards and attempting to, um, to eat the plants in our garden. Um, they, the damage that I see primarily is in the spring, summer, and in, or even into the fall, I primarily see rabbit damage done to perennial flowers and some annual flowers, certainly. Um, typically, perennials and annuals will kind of um, survive that, you know, the rabbit damage. Um, however, the, the damage that I see um, that can be a little bit more threatening to plants would be the damage that, damage that is being done in the winter that we honestly don't even know that it's being done, when it's being done, um, that when rabbits are out there um, in kind of the height of the winter eating the, the branches on uh, shrubs, they can really kind of nibble them down as, to pretty low and can, can cause some more severe damage. Uh, a little bit more information about rabbit damage. Um, typically, um, you know, rabbits have, you know, kind of a, um, a different palate, say, than deer, um, but they, um, you know, in, in general, they will eat whatever is available as long as it's not poisonous to them. Um, they just really have uh, an insatiable appetite and will kind of go to town wherever they're at and whatever they want to eat, honestly. <laughs> um, there are plants that are rabbit, um, 
they're rabbit resistant. Nothing is rabbit proof, um, but you know, kind of on the scale of what they like to eat, things that are typically very um, have very aromatic leaves, they'll tend to leave alone. Um, any um, plants with thorns, um, they would certainly not be on their first choice of eating. Um, obviously, um, plants with like the thick leathery leaves, they tend to leave alone. Um, so I would, the rabbit resistant perennial flowers that we're going to get to in some of the other plants, um, they typically have one of these attributes, whether it was a, you know, like a milky sap or prickly leaves or um, stems or, you know, aromatic when crushed leaves, um, they would tend to, um, you know, kind of uh, um, give the, either the plants a bad taste or a bad smell. Um, so here are the um, a list of botanical names of a whole kind of cross section of perennial flowers and even some ground covers that uh, rabbits will typically stay away from. Um, plants are are generally known by two different names. One is botanical name, the other is the common name. The list here are all botanical names, and then we'll get into some of the common names as we go into the particular slides. So the first one that I've highlighted is called Johnson's Blue Geranium. It is a perennial geranium. Um, it's also called Cranesbill. It does come back from year to year very nicely. Uh, Johnson's Blue has just an absolutely gorgeous blue flower and um, blooms almost the entire sum summer, really from you know early May all the way into mid to end of September. Um, it gets about 15 inches tall, 15 to 18 inches wide, um, with that very, very distinctive kind of cobalt blue flower with a white center. It is hardy, meaning again that it's perennial. It will live through the winter and come back year after year. Uh, this one is called Red Velvet Yarrow. Um, it's also called Achillea, is another is a botanical name for yarrow. Um, I love red velvet because it has a just the true, true red flower to it. Um, very bright and vibrant. Um, yarrow, in addition to having that really pretty bright red flower, also has a very fine textured, um, very soft leaf to it, almost a fern-like leaf. Um, it is a really low maintenance plant. It's kind of a plant that you can plant it and forget it and it will come back year after year after year. Um, so this is called Alcamilla mollis or ladies mantle. It has a really nice green scalloped leaf to it um, with a really um, kind of a, a small but pretty yellow flower. Um, the picture that you're seeing here, the scalp leaf has a little bit of a, um, you know, kind of a, some water droplets on it. So it's even making it, uh, making the plant look a little bit more um, more beautiful because of the, the reflection on those droplets of water. Um, yarrow, I'm sorry, ladies mantle do really, really well in a shade area. Um, they can take full shade with even, uh, you know, just a little bit of sun kind of mixed in there. Um, they're very, com well, they're pretty compact. They'll get about, I would say, a foot and a half tall by about a foot and a half wide um, and, you know, do well planted in mass in a shade area. The next plant highlighted here is Pardon My Purple. It is a bee balm. Um, it has a, almost kind of a daisy type flower, like a double daisy type flower. I really like Pardon My Purple for a couple of reasons. One, it's rabbit resistant, <laughs> but it also attracts um, pollinators such as honeybees or hummingbirds and butterflies. Um, has a very long lasting flower in the summer, anywhere from I would say June all the way through into September. I mean, it's also a newer version of a bee balm and that is mildew resistant. Unfortunately, some of the older versions of bee balms can get a powdery mildew on their leaves. This one um, does tends not to do that. Um, it is also bred um, because it is much less aggressive. It doesn't kind of spread as much um, as some of the other bee balm. Um, this is called the Colony Glabra or Turtle Head. Um, it is another perennial, kind of like that ladies' mantle that we just talked about, that will do well with a little bit of shade. It also does well in an area that might have a little bit of uh, moisture or maybe even a little bit of standing water. Um, it does attract butterflies, which is fantastic. Um, although, just make sure that when you plant it, um, it's an area where it can reach its full height because it can get, I would say, two and a half to three foot tall over time. 
Now this is called Napada Fasini Kit Kat, or also called Persian Cat Mint. Um, it again is a little bit of a newer variety of cat mint. Has that same really aromatic, um, when crushed leaves to it. Um, smells very, very minty as the name would apply. Um, it is also a plant that does really well with dried um, as a dried flower. Um, if you um, uh, would like to, you know, incorporate something in your garden that you could perhaps kind of keep in your home year round. Um, this is a plant that I would consider uh, growing not only because it's rabbit resistant, but then also because you can um, dry the flowers. Um, this is our first true ground cover. Um, it's called a black scallop ajuga or bugleweed. It's pretty compact. It's only going to get about six inches tall, but will over time kind of grow to about a foot or maybe a foot and a half in width. Um, these spiky blue flowers appear generally, I would say, um, early, like late spring, early summer, very, you know, a whole, you know, mass of ajuga. It's absolutely gorgeous in the spring when it's in full bloom. Not only does the plant have an attractive flower, but it also has an attractive, uh, pretty scalloped kind of chocolate colored leaf to it um, and really does well in some shade. It's another um, perennial flower that will you know, just attract pollinators and a little bit of shade and, and give you that color um, in the early summer. Anemone honore hover, also called Japanese windflower, is kind of the opposite end of the flowering spectrum is that ajuga that we talked just talked about. It doesn't even start blooming until August, September, and even into October um, when a lot of perennial flowers have kind of finished their flowering for the year. Um, this is another great plant for shade um, because it'll add a, just a really bright pop of that white color with a yellow center in those flowers. Um, it, the one thing I would say about anemone is um, it is very, very late to leaf out in the spring. So oftentimes homeowners will think that anemone has died, that it hasn't come back because you, know, you can look at where you plant, you know, where it was, say the previous fall, and you might need not even see any flowers or any leaves kind of coming up until well into maybe even May or June. Um, so don't give up on your anemone if you plant them. Just, you know, leave that area alone and give it a long time in the spring to start showing some color. Um, so this is called Helleborus Midnight Ruffles, um, also called Lenten Rose. Um, yes, this is a black flower, <laughs> somewhat unique and distinctive. Um, not only um, Helleborus are distinctive for a whole variety of different reasons. One reason for the black flower, but also because they bloom really, really early in the spring. I've seen Helleborus looking gorgeous in March. Um, I really, in addition to the um, flowers, I really like the leathery leaves on the Helleborus, kind of thick leathery leaves. Um, I think sometimes that those are almost as pretty as the flowers. And Helleborus is considered a evergreen perennial flower, meaning that even in the winter, you still have some of those, you know, remnants of the thick leathery leaves. They look great almost year round. Just to kind of continue with the theme of perennial flowers that are rabbit resistant, um, this is called Visions in White Astilbe, or it's also called Chinese False Astilbe or False Spirea. Um, you can see that it has a really nice uh, kind of pointed clear white flower to it. Again, um, like those anemones, it's going to give you a pop of color in the shade. Um, they tend to bloom you know, just for a couple of weeks, um, midsummer, um, but when they do flower, they look great. They also do have some nice serrated leaves to them, very glossy leaf. Um, this is one very durable, tough plant. Um, once it's established, um, it'll withstand a little bit of drought, you know, more so than other astilbe varieties. Um, and, and it has a very compact habit at about 18 inches tall, 18 to 24 inches wide. This is called Millennium Allium, or also called Ornamental Onion. Um, you can see the really nice purple globe flowers. Um, they kind of just, you know, appear out of stalks in, in midsummer. Um, the, the only thing I would, well, I would say that this is absolutely deer and rabbit resistant. I think one of the, I know one of the reasons it's deer and rabbit resistant is because it's very fragrant. Um, whenever I see this flowering in my yard and it comes back year after year and looks great, I always remember probably about, it's been like 15 years, um, 
my daughter, she was uh, probably five or six at the time, she wanted to um, pick a bouquet of flowers for her great grandmother. So, you know, we got the scissors out, we went out, picked out a bouquet of flowers, um, and then brought them over to my great, to my grandmother. Um, she accept, accepted them very lovingly and we displayed them. The only problem is they stunk so bad because obviously as the name implies, they're an onion and they smelled so awful. So that's the one thing, you know, we've talked about, you know, the, uh, the nepeta that will be a good dried flower or, I mean, even the astilbes can be a good dried flower. Um, this, I would not add to that list um, just because of the odor. Um, Coreopsis grub. if somebody was like really to kind of uh, make me narrow down what my favorite perennial flower is, I think I would have to choose the grub Coreopsis because it is just so foolproof. It blooms for months on end. Uh, um, you know, almost a never ending perennial flower, a perennial flower that blooms like an annual flower. And it looks absolutely spectacular year after year after year. Deer resistant, rabbit resistant, attracts butterflies. <laughs> um, it has that really pretty yellow flower. Um, just a fantastic perennial flower. If you have room in your garden, I would highly encourage you to, you know, consider, you know, tucking a couple of these in somewhere. In full, I would say in full sun. They really, um, they really do need as much sun as you can give them. So this is called Salvia caradana or meadow sage. Um, it is, I know there's some annual sages. This is a perennial sage. Um, this is one plant that does a little bit better if you um, deadhead it. It will give you several, you know, kind of a showings of flowers uh, but after it's done you know flowering for the first time i would just kind of take a scissors out there cut all the old um, spent blooms off of them just you know cut down until the first set of leaves and then it will continue it will give you another show of color a couple of weeks after that um, just a really pretty you can see dark um, purple spikes of flowers um, just a, li a little bit of work, not you know quite as um, carefree as that crabs as we just took a look at, um, but a really nice purple flower in addition to your yard. Um, this is called a Pulmonium Stairway to Heaven or Jacob's Ladder. Um, what I really like about Jacob's Ladder is twofold. One, the very beautiful, of course, kind of light blue flowers that appear pretty early in May. And then also the really variegated, pretty variegated leaves. Um, the leaves, it's a green leaf with kind of a, um, kind of a pale, very pale yellow, almost you know, white margin to them. And some of the leaves will even have a little bit of kind of a pink cast to them. Absolutely a beautiful addition to any shade garden. So <laughs> a little bit more information about um, protecting your plants. Um, so, you know, unfortunately, um, I think we're all creatures of habit. <laughs> you know, we can look at lots and, you know, lots of beautiful flowers, but, you know, in plant, you can plant a whole series of rabbit resistant flowers. Um, but um, unfortunately, if the rabbits get into the habit of, um, of eating your flowers, it's difficult, you know, to get them, you know, to do someone else, something else. And basically that's what you're trying to do is to break their habit. We're all creatures of habit. We all, you know, like to do, you know, things in certain orders. We know whether it's always having the same thing for um, breakfast or having your favorite meal on Friday, something like that. So it's really a matter of um, one, try to prevent the rabbits from getting into your yard. And then also, if they do, then trying to change their habit and, and getting, honestly, them to eat somebody else's, <laughs> to eat your neighbor's plants, not yours. <laughs> so here's a couple of methods for protecting your yard. Um, one method might be to, as we've just talked about, you know, kind of at length, plant resistant plants. The other thing that um, I would encourage you to do, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, is just try to modify your habitat to change things up a little bit. Um, I would also consider, um, we're going to talk about some rabbit repellents. Um, it's really repelling rabbits based on their sense of smell, their sense of sight, you know, all of their senses, hearing, um, just trying to do whatever you can, um, you know, to repel them. 
Um, and then finally, um, if you know, you've tried some of the other things and it's just not working, you may just want to put up a physical barrier, kind of as a last resort, but just to really protect your plants. So ways to protect your plants. Um, we talked about repelling um, rabbits through, you know, sense of sight and smell and hearing. Um, rabbits do, um, as you would imagine, rely heavily on their sense of smell. And that's what we, we've talked about planting plants that are, you know, very odorous. Um, one thing that you could do is, um, you know, put things out that um, would repel the plants uh, based on their side of, based on their sense of smell. So a couple things that do that, um, there's some homemade repellents. There are some homemade repellents, um, such as like you could use a fa fabric softener or you could wrap up bars of soap. Um, you could also use bags of human hair as well as blood meal. Um, those are, um, again, ways to repel rabbits based on their sense of smell. The uh, the one thing that I would say is rabbits um, tend to get, if you use the same thing over and over, they're going to tend to get used to it. So uh, for a couple of weeks, you might have um, put some fabric softener or sheets out there and then kind of bring those in and then put um, bars of Irish spring soap out there and then kind of, you know, change it, then do, you know, bags of human hair or blood meal. So just kind of rotating things. Obviously, having a dog will help, <laughs> or maybe stopping bad groomers and see if you can pick up some dog hair and kind of, you know, mix that in with your plants. Um, also, as we talked about planting different types of plants, such as the rabbit resistant. Other items um, that you can consider doing would be, uh, uh, would be um, using this homemade mixture of rabbit repellents. Um, there's just a kind of an easy recipe. Um, it consists of four eggs, two ounces of red pepper sauce, and then two ounces of garlic blended with water. Um, mix that all up and then spray it on your plants. Um, again, I would though rotate that with um, things like, you know, baby powder or maybe even some predator urine. Um, here is examples of squirrels damage. <laughs> We've uh, probably all at one point in our lives see squirrels kind of, you know, doing the digging that they do. Um, but not, not only do they do the digging, but that they can also, you know, kind of burrow and eat around the lower trunks of trees. Um, I don't see in your community, in our community, I don't see a lot of squirrel damage, you know, other than, you know, maybe digging up some mulch. Um, but they certainly, you know, can, you know, can cause that damage. Um, ways to protect your yard. If you do have a lot of squirrels that are digging on plant uh, flowers that squirrels don't like. Um, if they're tending to, I know, actually, I do know in my yard, they tend to dig up bulbs <laughs> when I plant, like I plant in the fall, spring blooming bulbs. Um, if you had wanted to, you know, say plant tulip bulbs in a particular area, you could plant the tulip bulbs. And then on um, top of the tulip bulbs, lay out some chicken wire, cover it with some topsoil and mulch, and then the bulbs will grow up through the chicken wire. The other thing that you could do is put out human, as we talked about with rabbits, put out human or dog hair as a deterrent. Um, you can just maybe shake some cayenne pepper in the area or add some bone meal. Again, we're all, um, we're just trying to repel the squirrels. These are some plants that squirrels don't like. Um, the depth daffodils, uh, the alliums, as we had talked about in the previous couple of sides previously, um, galanthus, fritillaries, hyacinth, the lily of the valley, and then the, um, the perennial and the annual geraniums. This is what I do see <laughs> are the chipmunk damage. And you, if we look really close in that mulch, we can see the remnants of a bulb that chipmunk dug up. Um, again, uh, they're you know, kind of like those rabbits. They're very cute, but they dig. They do a lot of digging and they, you know, burrowing to to nest. Um, here are a couple of methods, and they're very similar to the methods that we had talked about using for squ squirrel damage. Um, sprinkle some dog or cat hair, bone meal, maybe some red pepper. Like go to I know at one point we went to Sam's Club and it's got a big um, container of cayenne pepper and sprayed it in one particular area of our yard. 
Um, you can also maybe plant some daffodils around just to kind of um, repel the chipmunks because they don't like the daffodils. Um, or maybe even just kind of introduce some bird feeders <laughs> because um, generally the um, bird feeders will attract the chipmunks. So you want to, you know, get the bird feeders maybe towards the back of your property and then have the chipmunks go over there rather than, you know, around your home where they could do a little bit more damage. Um, this is an example of bowl damage. This is what it would typically look like um, early in the spring, just as the, the grass is starting to green up. Um, the bowl damage has actually been done several months prior to this in the winter when this lawn was probably covered in snow. The voles were kind of burrowing and making tunnels underneath the grass eating the roots of the grass and therefore you have the, the dead, you know, the dead grass in the spring that's visible. Um, voles, uh, as I just talked about, um, they, they really just, you know, kind of burrow underneath the lawn and eat as many of the roots as possible. Some, uh, winters I have even seen where they've, um, or some springs actually I've seen what they've done the previous winter. Um, they really kind of nine around the crown of trees and kind of in that, that root, um, tree circle area, root area. Um, they, and what we had seen in the previous slide is just, um, is described in this last sentence. They really, you know, kind of do make those surface runways, <laughs> um, that are visible after the snow melts, unfortunately, and they, they can be quite extensive come spring. Here's a couple of ways to protect your yard, primarily from rabbit damage. I'm, I'm sorry, from vole damage. Um, and again, they can, you know, they can pretty severely damage a lawn over the winter. Um, really, you just um, would want to try to make your habitat less suitable to them, you know, try to um, provide them some food and protection in other areas. <laughs> um, one, there are commercial re vole repellents available. One particular repellent is called a mole max. Um, even though it's called mole max, it works very well on voles. Um, that is a liquid that you can apply to, to kind of repel the voles out of your yard. Um, hopefully though, over time, um, there will be um, like a more natural control of voles in this area. Um, I know coyotes and foxes and hawks will all um, tend to eat voles and uh, would, you know, kind of narrow down the population over time. <laughs> Um, again, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Here are some additional articles um, that if you wanted more information about um, protecting your yard and your plants from rabbits and bulls and squirrels. Um, one final note, I just wanted to um, highlight the perennial plant of this year. Um, it is a plant called uh, Calamintha nepeta, or also called lesser catmint. Um, we had talked about the Kit Kat cat mint in this, um, in this presentation. Um, this is similar, just a little bit taller, a little bit wider over time. Um, but it is the perennial plant of 2021. And I just wanted to make sure to uh, let you know about that. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. It's Kathleen at thegrowingscene.com. Thank you again and have a great uh, rest of your day.